well. Um, on behalf of the Committee on Stochastic Programming, it is once again my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar series, Decision Making in an Uncertain World. I'm Guzimbay Aksan from the Ohio State University. And once again, I would uh, really like to thank my colleagues on the Committee of Stochastic Programming for making this uh, series a uh, reality. And um, today we have a very distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Alexander Shapiro. And um, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, okay. Um, so Professor Shapiro is uh, the Russell Chandler Chair and Professor in the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. And he has published more than 140 uh, journal articles. Uh, in 2004, Dr. Shapiro joined the ISI highly cited researchers. He's also um, co-author of several books, some of which are um, you know, widely used in our community. Um, for instance, the um, Handbook of Stochastic Programming with Professor Ruzinski and the Lectures on Stochastic Programming with uh, Professor Terenka Dancheva and Andrzej Ruzinski. And he was on the editorial board of um, several journals. Most notably, he was the area editor of uh, optimization in operations research. And he also served as the editor in chief in mathematical programming. He has numerous um, talks, awards, uh, many, many of them. So I just want to highlight uh, some of the important ones. So in 2013, he was um, awarded the Kachian Prize, which is a lifetime achievement award by the Informed Optimization Society. In 2018, he was the recipient of the Danzig Award, uh, which is given by the uh, Mathematical Optimization Society and SIEM. And this year, uh, he was uh, elected as a member of the National Academy of Engineering, which is among the highest uh, honors. And uh, his election was uh, for the contributions, uh, for his contributions to the theory, competitions, and applications of stochastic programming. Uh, which brings me to his talk. So today he will be actually talking about theoretical competitional uh, aspects of uh, solving multi-stage programs together with uh, an application to the uh, Brazilian energy system. And um, so it will be the perfect combination of the three. And um, before we start uh, all our speakers, uh, we ask them, uh, what is your view of the decision-making under uncertainty or your current approach? Uh, it's a very deep question, but uh, with a very uh, short answer, uh, if, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, I will, let you take it from here, Professor. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction and for your invitation to give a talk. It's a big pleasure for me to do that. Now, let me say it's clearly that what I will say today is my personal opinion. It's all open for discussion. Okay. So I think that the most important development in the last years say 15, 20 years, was in stochastic programming, was development of randomization algorithms. This gives very different view on stochastic optimization and stochastic programming in general from what was uh, dominant in stochastic programming until, say, in the last century. In particular, it, it's, it was, uh, it's theory was developed, algorithms, so they start to be applied. It was more clearly understood what problems are tractable, can be solved with reasonable accuracy, often sufficient for engineering applications, and what really probably computationally is intractable. I'll talk a little bit about that. I have just less than 50 minutes to talk from what I understand. So I'll touch some topics just given probably general. I also, uh, hopefully I'll have time. So at the end, I'll talk some maybe new development and also try to mention what uh, is uh, still goals or problems we still face in uh, all these type of things. Let me mention one last thing that uh, traditionally there were several 
societies that worked on, uh, on optimization under uncertainty. Uh, probably the largest one, much bigger than stochastic programming, was market decision processes, optimal control. Now, uh, historically, this stochastic problem was developed quite independently of that. And uh, the class of problems that both societies tried to some solve or approach and model was a uh, I would overlap between all of them, but the approaches of modeling, solving was very difficult, different. I hope that at this time now to this both societies will try to learn from each other the uh, achievements of them. And uh, last thing that probably I will try to say, one of this, I think this really urgent pro or task that we have is a creation of library of the problems, which uh, in other areas in uh, like linear programming, they have a library. If anybody can claim that he can, he can do better than the, the previous one, can try the algorithms, numerical procedures on that library. We don't have it in our society. The attempts have been made long ago, but not successful. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that modeling in stochastic algebra of uncertainty and uncertainty is much more involved. So how to make even standardization of that is not completely obvious, but I think we really need that. I will say some words about that later. So this is basically, can I start? Okay. Now, uh, I will talk mainly about multi-stage, but let me, so what it, but generally, let me start with generally what we try to model and solve. There is a, we have two things here. We have this data that is coming. It can be considered as data process, this observation, whatever you call it. And uh, we talk about discrete time. Every period of time we observe some realization of something. Okay? And it, they, it can be vector process, it can be more complex than that, and then we make a decision. When we make the decision, our decision is supposed to be made based on information that we have at that time. So the, uh, we usually, this, uh, at, uh, at least how this our world is working, we're supposed to know the past, we don't know what will be in the future. We try to make the projections, some assumptions, what happens future, and this is how we try to model the process. So we have decision, observation, and that. Now, in the talk today, I will make two very basic assumptions about the data process. And it's not only possible, right? but in stochastic optimization, I'll make two basic assumptions. First, the data process is supposed to be a sequence of vectors, and it's supposed to be random, stochastic. This is a very strong assumption because and the probability theory was developed for centuries. Right? We view that as a random with all these uh, implications of that, which we'll talk later. It's not the only possible way. Right? There's alternatives to that. A, I don't have much time to talk about that. So this is the first assumption that I'll make in immediately. The second assumption I'll make in this talk is that the randomness, the stochastic out process, I'll call it Xi1, Xi T. This is a sequence of random vectors. The distribution, probability distribution of that is independent of our decisions. This is also a very strong assumption because if we will not make it, it will be different. It's again possible, the same market decision processes, they do, they assume that they don't assume and so on, right? Uh, they, it's a different way how one can index that. It's convenient here to think about x1 as deterministic. We make the decision at the first stage before observing any realization of the random data. So for 
Because of that, I will, C1, this also we think deterministic, it's actually for uniformity of notation. Now, next. So far, we just define the process of our decisions. And this is very important, how we make decisions. It's always conditional on the, what we observed in the past. Please remember that. This is a key of all, more, most of the things that I'll be talking about. Right? So next, we are supposed to optimize something. Let's, next, let's say minimize. Right? We have a cost. We have a cost functions okay, that uh, depend on our decision and the realization of the process. Let's see this. The first stage is supposed to be deterministic, right? So it's written like that. And what we do, we optimize, we minimize it on average. We take expected value of that. What it exactly means, I'll say in a moment. Why expected value? This is a very good question. And so very often it's taken for granted. We take the expected value. These are the other possibilities. I will not talk much about that. Uh, very often it can be justified by, sometimes in probably, sometimes it can be justified by low of large numbers. So if we repeat our decision many, many times, on average, it's converged to the expected value. Okay? Now, this say, when we say that I will write that the expected value, there are two things here, which again, very, it, can, it can be very involved. We assume certain probability distribution of our random process. Where we get it? Very good questions. And um, again, I don't have much time to talk about that. It's coming from the modeling part of that. And then uh, you probably know there's a lot of discussion that, that we don't know that exactly. Sometimes we don't know it at all and so on and so on and so on. I don't have time to talk about that. So here I assume that we have a reason, we have historical data, maybe I'll say some more soon after that. We have historical data and we can reasonably model the probability distribution of our random process. We will be more specific later. Now, the most, the really here when we talk about that, there are also constraints. And please look how these constraints are constructed. The most important in natural where we looking at that is a linear. Everything is linear. In other words, this, our constraints are linear. This is given like that. Typically, this is a type of balance equations. What we are, the, our decision at the time t is connected to the previous decision, and all these components here, these parameters there, are supposed to be random. Some of them random. In that case, this, uh, in that case we can write this problem in that case. Now, what is very important is that what, the, what we optimize here, we optimize our decision policies or also called decision rules. Okay? So every time we make decision, we observe the past. This is a notation for this, okay? for this all of that. All our decisions, uh, all the realization of that data process up to time t, and our decision is a function. So if we go back here, this is not ex explicitly written here, and this is often how it's written. But a, when I write it like that, this a, I want to emphasize that we optimize our functions of data process. And these functions only depend on the data, on what we observe up to time t. That makes this problem, even linear, very difficult to solve. From modeling point of view, modeling point of view, when we model random process as a statistician, it's often modeled in a, as continuous distributions. I'll talk about that. So, in that sense, the, our decisions are functions of random data and also random. So when we take expected value here, this is random, and this is random, and the constraints are random. And the constraints are supposed to be, should be satisfied, this feasibility constraints, for almost every realization of the process. Okay? So that makes this problem, from the beginning, very difficult to solve. 
to model and to solve because we supposed to solve infinite dimensional problems. Please remember that. And uh, it, in fact, it looks hopeless. Okay. Now, uh, until uh, maybe 20 years ago, it was uh, in stochastic program and this approach was dominated by generating scenarios. If I want to put this problem in a computer, a right? computer will not understand this infinite dimensional problem. I will need to somehow discretize that. What I mean discretize, this, uh, this in a stochastic problem, you can see that almost any book, one generates certain type of scenario streams. This is what can happen. I will talk about that in a moment. Right? So we make discretization of the random process. And every, this, it's called scenarios. This is what supposedly what to happen. And we assign to that some numbers, which we call probabilities. Okay. So the non-anticipative, this, this terrible word non-anticipative, is that we, every time we make decision, it's based on what we observed so far. So if I want to solve this problem and I, I, I take obligation to give to the user right, a, some algorithm procedure, what decision to make at every period of t based on historical data. Right? This is a policy that I suppose, policy decision rule, which I suppose to give to the user. Now, uh, if I generate scenarios, and this is a discretization of the process. And uh, this, if this, what will really happen will be different from these scenarios, I cannot generate or everything. Okay? I, it's not even clear what decision the user should make because it doesn't tell them directly. This is all, already a problem. Now, this is what I said. I, 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 this, I don't know. I, I suppose the slides will be available to you, so if you want to read it afterwards, but I'll talk. Now, uh, one of the way how to solve that this uh, by generating scenarios. If you have some books on stochastic problem, you can see it everywhere. And uh, for use, usually one use only first stage decision, which is deterministic made before observing any realization of the data. And then one can say, okay, I make the decision. It's deterministic somehow. It should be simply feasible. Then next period of time, I observe the data. I recalculate it. It will be my next decision and so on. It's called rolling horizon type of approach. Uh, good it or not, I hope I'll have time to discuss it. Right? Now, uh, the traditionally this it's all started from two stage linear program it's called with recourse it's going back to early days of linear programming t equal to just one stage ahead now uh, what is already here you can see immediately problem and the problem is the following Think about that as just two stage t equal to, okay. and you have random randomness, the random data. It's a possible realization of that. So if the corresponding vector C has several components, and you start to discretize every marginal distribution, it's d-dimensional vector. Okay. The number of scenarios, number of possibilities, grow exponentially with dimension. But the data that you enter in the computer, assuming that components of random vector independent, is going to increase linearly. So because of that, it's not surprising that one look at this, what is called deterministic equivalent. In other words, when you generate fi the finite number of scenarios, say, in linear program, it's possible to write as one large linear program, which has the number of the parameters decision where will be proportional to number of scenarios, it's computationally intractable, even from this point of view, from the deterministic point of view. And the first paper of that type that was uh, this paper of that, 
And then recently, very nice paper was written by this. Okay. And uh, it's proof there that even in this very simple case, from deterministic point of view, two-stage linear programs are computationally intractable as, in other words, as dimensional start of random vector start to grow, it's impossible to solve with very high accuracy. It's not surprising at all, this type of result. So, and in fact, uh, this doesn't, it's, uh, so from this point of view, right, from the beginning we say, okay, we cannot solve them. But it's not the end of the story. In fact, this first paper, when it was received and it was published, was not noticed at all. People just simply ignored it. Now, the big improvement, a big step forward was made by, it started uh, systematically done, at least in our community about 20 years ago, by a development of randomization algorithm based on Monte Carlo sampling. From the beginning, I would I want to say that solved stochastic programming problems, the accuracy of high accuracy, like uh, what is used in linear programming, say 10 to the minus five, minus six, is deceiving because uh, uncertainty, this inaccuracies coming from modeling, from engineering, usually far bigger than that. It's even misleading trying to solve that. So, it was uh, very often to solve this type, this type of problem, this reasonable accuracy, say precision of 1% or something like that, sufficient for engineering applications. Now, uh, there's a big discussion now, okay, you probably noticed that, a how to solve even linear, even say convex problems, by randomization, there are two, basically two approaches now that's available. One approach is a ve this very simple idea, which is going a long way back. It's, it's now called SA method. One generate a sample of that random sample and approximate the expected value by the average and then try to solve that. The complex computational complexity of that model is proportional to the sample size that one generates. The other, this is not an algorithm because after this, this problem is uh, uh, constructed, one still has to solve it by some, but it's very general. One can use it for integer program, mixed integer program, convex, non-convex. So after this J constructing this such a problem, uh, one can put it, it's its favorite uh, software. There's, uh, the other is stochastic approximation, sto uh, uh, stochastic gradient methods, which is algorithm. I don't have much time to talk about that. So you probably saw that. But what I want to say that currently, certain classes of static problems, which is in particular two-stage problem, you can think about that function is a value of this first and second stage. Okay. is uh, we have quite good understanding and there are a lot of, lot of numerical evidence that some classes of problems can be solved uh, reasonably well. And this methodology was developed and all that. So in other words, for the static type of problem, what I mean by static, that this value, this values here for every possible realization and probably in convex case subgradient can be computed in a reasonably efficient way. Two-stage linear stochastic programming are like that. Okay. Now, when we go to multi-stage, much less is known. Uh, from, and uh, this is a complex, uh, this, what was also developed is what is called sample complexity. It was developed in different areas of the solving, this point of view of solving a static, stochastic optimization problem. And uh, this, uh, it's possible to show, this question is how large the sample size I need in order to solve this problem with certain accuracy. And this is relatively simple bound coming from large deviations, which guarantee me that with certain probabilities, remember this SA problem is random. 
So this uh, depends on random sample. So if I want certain type of guarantees, this confidence, this is corresponds to the confidence level. This is a precision that we solve, the, uh, that we want to solve the true problem. True problem probably even has continuous distribution or astronomically large number of these uh, scenarios. And this is how we solve the approximation problem. You can take it as zero, the computational, the computer precision. So this, this some, somewhat represents variability of the model. I'll talk about that later. No, this is a simple, relatively simple bound. One can do more sophisticated things about that. Right? Now, from this point of view, number of scenarios is irrelevant. It can be infinite if the distribution is continuous. There's a lot of misconception about this now. Many people now start to use because it's very easy to use the same method. Very often it give you, it solves the problem with reasonable accuracy. Of course, there's always possible to construct problem that uh, would be not possible to solve. But very often it works. Okay, now. Now, a, a, by now, this, this uh, static is reasonably well understood from theoretical point of view, numerical point of view, application point of view, and so on. When we go from that, we go to general multi-stage problem, situation is much more involved. Okay. And uh, this, this, uh, if I want to, continue to do something similar to that, I need to approximate the whole process, random process, not just one random vector, but the whole process is going. And remember, my decisions here, uh, I'll jump, uh, uh, conditional. So if you look at this scenario three, that if it's any books on stochastic program and papers and all that, how it's uh, constructed. You in the beginning you deterministic, you before you observe that, then you say, okay. This is that how many possible realization I have with second stage conditional on every node. This is how many realization I'll have next and so on. It generates this scenario three of possible sample path, possible scenarios. Uh, this is the scenario three, this construction of this scenario three represent in some sense what they think can happen in the future. We discretize that, we model that and so on. So that we cite the certain probabilities of every scenario three, uh, every sample, every scenario, and that generate certain process, random process. The point is that the number of the scenarios in this construction go also increase also exponentially with number of stages. So if somehow for static probably we are able to deal with this exponential growth of number of scenarios because of increase of number of parameters of this of, uh, components of random vector, here we have additional exponential growth with number of stages. And uh, available uh, estimate of complexity of that is of that order that it's possible, similar to what we've had before. And uh, it gives very, pessimistic view on multi-stage stochastic problem. In fact, there are strong reasons to believe, it's not mathematical theorem, but it's strong reason, reasons to believe that from the point of view that we just talked about, that we want to solve it for say, pro-random process, maybe even continuous distribution, uh, computationally intractable in general. Now, uh, it's a multi-stage programming is too important to be dismissed that simple. So the question is the first realization that generically we probably cannot solve even linear multi-stage stochastic programming the way it was how it was formulated before motivate to think about approximations. And this is a very complicated question because it's coming from the model. When one model is supposed to be some realistic uh, problem, one can think about two things. On one hand, the model should be reasonably realistic. 
On the other hand, it, it should be possible to do something about that moment. So here we talk about numerical solutions. Mm. So this brings questions. Now, uh, alternative to scenario generation also has very long history, going back uh, maybe 70 years ago, classical work of Bellman and even before Bellman is dynamic programming equation, dynamic programming. Dynamic programming, I don't know if you saw it before. One tried to summarize that going backward in time. This is what is written here is uh, some summary of that for the problem that we consider for generic problem. At the last stage, we look at this, uh, we're supposed to solve this problem. This is, will be the function of this realization at last stage and the previous, our previous decision. And then we go back what in time. And uh, when we go back in time, we need to compute conditional expectation. Every time we make that, we have to look at that, this conditional expectation. So this is what is called cost to go function of the value function in this formulation. They depend on the previous decision and the whole history of the process. This is the history of the process up to the time t. Uh, at the first stage, one's supposed to solve that. That make it, uh, this dependent on so many variables, make it uh, computationally intractable. Because no, when we, this, we look at that, there are several problems there. One has to solve this optimization problem. One has to compute the, uh, this conditional expectations. And the more, probably the most difficult part of that is how to represent this cost to go function in a computer. Because every time at every stage, I have to keep track of that. And when I optimize that, I need this function. Yeah. So now, from application's point of view, just to think about that in a stochastic this process in this gen very generic terms is not very useful. I can even model that. Typically, from, from application, from modeling point of view as a statistician, we always, always model that in some, in some, is even some Markovian structure of the process. I cannot remember all the past. Even just remember them, it's impossible. In a, I have to put it in a computer. So we have to make certain assumptions about the process in that case. From scenario point of view, it doesn't matter. We just generate scenario three. Here, we have to make assumptions about the process. And the simplest assumption is the, is the, for the following. Right? Called, uh, it has different names. No, let's call it stage-wise independence. In other words, we assume this is a, every, uh, realis, uh, every vector here is random vector. But we assume that stochastically, it's independent on the previous one. In other words, our process is independent from one stage to another. This is very strong assumptions, which you very often is not satisfied in applications. Uh, but sometimes it's possible to deal with that. But let's for the moment assume that. If we assume that, that stage was independence, when we look at the last stage, when I have this, when I look at this conditional expectation of that, because that is independent of this, uh, the CT, CT is independent on the previous history, it will be unconditional expectation. So going backward in time by induction, it's a theorem, but not difficult, but a theorem. It's possible to show that that case, everything simplified see, dramatically. Right? Our Cost, uh, this uh, cost to go functions that only depend at time t plus one on the previous observation and current in realization of the data. We take expected value of that with respect to marginal distribution of that because when it's a stage wise independent, we only know to know marginal distribution of that. And then this is a, a we only have this a remember in the computer that still when this and this is a uh, related to what is called state variables what we really have to remember when we do that it's also big 
question where one can talk about only, only about that. But the point is that in, if we assume that, we don't have to remember the previous realization of the data. This is a very big thing. Okay? And our policy is there will be, if I somehow can compute this value function, expected cost to go function, right? In some sense, I solved the problem. Of course, again, as the dimension of that start to grow, of, that, of the state variable start to grow, how to represent this function, multivariate function in the computer. Only in very simple cases, it can be written analytically. So this was recognized from the beginning as a course of dimensionality, was recognized from the beginning in the dynamic program. So it has its own limitations now. So if we cannot solve that precisely, one can think about approximations. Uh, there is again, as I said, this, uh, the strong reasons to believe that uh, generically, multi-stage problems computationally intractable. So the question how to approximate that. This is one way of doing that. We can try to approximate this cost to go function is human that. Very well, sometimes it can be reduced to that or there's some other uh, tricks one can do. Now, uh, if we do that, uh, uh, in the control M MDP, typically, they assume the state space is fine. In other words, in our case, it will require discretization of this, run of this decision variables. In linear case, they are continuous. If I start to discretize them, the number of the point for discretization of the state, because I have to remember that in a computer, also grow exponentially. So it's, a, it's made it impossible to do, say, for dimension of that greater than three. Think about that. If there's one dimensional, I probably can easily discretize it. Maybe 1,000 points will be very good discretization. I can solve that, because this is what I will remember in a computer. In two dimensions, it will be thousand by million and so on. Impossible. Now, uh, so one of the it's one of the possible approaches is to use what as people call approximate dynamical programming. In other words, we try to approximate this value function in computationally feasible way. The question is how. And there are different approaches. Very often people use it in, uh, in, in, in control and that they use the basis functions. I will not talk about that. What is very important in optimization is convexity when we solve convex problems. It's more important than differentiability. Now, when we talk about, for example, for in look at linear problem problems, the co corresponding cost to go functions are convex. It's not difficult to prove. Now, uh, so when we talk about convex, so trying to solve this convex problem, there is a classical approach in deterministic case by cutting plane. It's going to famous to famous paper by Kelly, uh, how many sixty years ago, of cutting plane method. In other words, you think, and there will have been talk about this type of approach. I will not talk too much about that. I don't have much time left. Right? What we try to do, we try to approximate uh, this cost to go function by cut and plane, by piecewise linear approximations. So in the stochastic program, uh, this method was going to this, to that. You can see that. Uh, where it was applied to scenario trees, right? The big step forward was made in that paper, where they say they already this was formulated in terms of dynamical programming, dynamical value functions, and randomization. Now I I don't have much time to talk about that, so let me talk very quickly. You probably already saw the first talk about this method. This one tried to approximate this cost to go function by piecewise function going backward and forward. 
and constructing the, uh, this, uh, adding more and more cuts to all these value functions, cost to growth functions, and they push low bound up. And this is a certain type of cut and plane method. Okay. Now, uh, it's, uh, it's known that in uh, this in deterministic, the scalar cut and plane method is not very good, is not good. There are much better methods were developed after that. And uh, with this regularization level, level method of uh, Lena Rachel, Nestor of Minerovsky, this works much, much better than that, trust region method. It's not clear how to extend this far more efficient method to multi-stage case. And the reason for that is that remember, we try to optimize over feasible policies and that by itself is random. It's not completely clear. In the deterministic case, you need to approximate your objective function well near the optimal solution. Here, you don't know where will be next realization of your policy. So it's not clear how to do that. It's one of the problems. Also attempts have been made, but uh, it's not clear. Uh, now, uh, please remember that we try to solve here the problem with probably continuous distributions. So I'll call it a true problem. We make discretization of that. The SA method just make discretization of the marginal distributions of every random vector, assuming that they stage-wise independent. Still, if I have, say, make 100 discretization points of every, at every stage, the number of scenarios will grow exponentially. Okay. Now, uh, let me say that uh, this very simple observation, so that when we construct this approximation of the value function, they define op policy also for the true problem, because I can go here when it's, and here I can use approximations of that and define the policy for the true problem also. So I can compare that. This is a big deal. And there's all the statistical analysis. Now I have just a few minutes left, something like five minutes. So say, let me say the following now. The solving multi-stage, even linear problem in Poland, even in uh, this very difficult, you know, probably generically intractable. One of the questions that we face, why we really need to solve that many stages? Right. Maybe they say just look and few stages ahead will be sufficient for because uh, in applications almost always people use just first stage solution. This is type of rolling horizon type of approach. This is a question. What is a va really value multi stage problem? Now, one of the things that we try to solve this practical problem or is end of horizon effect. What it means is that. If I will minimize something, uh, some, uh, some type of problem, try to solve this type of problem, and uh, I, instead of that, I'll try to solve one or two stages, the algorithm tell me to use all my resources after one or two stages, because it doesn't care what happens afterwards, right? the algorithm. This is not very good. So this is called end of horizon effect. I will probably not have much time to talk about that. So how to deal with it? Now, in the many cases, when people look at that, this, from the modeling point of view, the data has periodical behavior. This is one that became famous pro Brazilian project, uh, the optimization on monthly basis, and then it repeats itself, because how else you can predict the future? So here we can borrow the idea of from optimal control. This is so-called infinite horizon problems with discount. This is what is written here. Right. And uh, we can assume certain type of periodical behavior of that. 
This is what is written here. We assume that uh, this period, this is a certain period M, say 12 months, and then it repeats itself stochast uh, from stochastic point of view. If we do it like that, right, we can write what is called Bellman equations for that. Sometimes we'll call the Bellman equations for that, which we look at the stationary solution of the dependent on initial conditions. And that drastically reduce number of stages depending on how long the period we consider and automatically take care of random of horizon effect. This is what is written here. If I'll take period M of equal one, it will be completely stationary. I can take period at 12, say months, and it after that it repeats itself. So it comes to solving these equations and it's uh, this in, if we take it's equal to one it's coming to that this is a just variant of classical bellman equation that we use in optical control and mdp it's the classical result says that uh, the corresponding operator that we look at this operator that is written there is has this property is called a contraction property and then by famous Banach theorem, it has fixed point. That means it, it's unique. And that means the equation that I will have under certain mild condition has solution and its solution is unique. Okay. It's possible to also to talk about sample complexity. I don't have much time. I want to show you some results. I have just two minutes left. Okay. It's possible to talk about sample complexity. Now how large the sample size that I have, it's not a coming from general construction. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, this is relatively recent development just we have now, when you look at the classical SDP method, it has low bound and has upper bound. Upper bound is stochastic. One generate this uh, sample path, point estimate of the expected and then average that. You probably saw that. When we deal here and when the discount factor gamma is close to one, it's very difficult to implement that because one has to take very long approximation of infinite. So what is, was recently developed was dual approach to linear multi-stage problem, which simply dualize this uh, feasibility constraints. And it works. I have just one minute left. Started with this idea, started with this paper, and we follow your recent, uh, our recent paper. Uh, it's possible to write Lagrangian, possible to write also dual problem. Well, if you look at this, it's, uh, you can think about that in for final number of scenarios, it's very large linear problem and problem. As linear problem it has dual by classical theory of linear problem, and if the value is finite, it's primal and dual has the same, have the same value, so we can talk about trying to solve the dual problem. It's possible to write the corresponding equation. I don't have, I just have probably one minute, yes. Just show, let me show you this. It's famous, became famous this, uh, example with originally 120 stages. Periodical behavior is naturally 12 here. And uh, it's possible, it turns out that experiments by solving this periodical time, which drastically reduce number of stages from 120 to 12 give very similar solution at least first few stages and it's possible also construct the dual bounds and uh, that looks and that works quite well even when the discount factor is very close to one when discount factor is close to one it's difficult to solve the more the more discount factor closer to one is more numerically difficult it's well known in uh, when you talk about Bellman equation so it's still possible to so we were able to solve that even for that discovery very close to one in reasonable time and give low and upper bound which give us very, this is low bound after discretization it's still going on how it will affect real they when we talked about a true problem how it's still going on so i think i need i have to stop here yes Yes. Um, yes, thank you, Professor Shapiro, for this nice talk. Um, and you are right on time. <laughs> I know.
um, perfectly. Um, so it is now um, uh, open to the audience for questions. And uh, please uh, use the chat uh, function of the Zoom and uh, please type in your question. Reading it. So to get it started, uh, let me ask you. Uh, so this uh, periodic behavior. So it depends on the um, underlying stochastic process, I assume. Like the twelve was like the twelve monthly, and then conditions like maybe the sub problems are same. Like what are the conditions that cause this periodic behavior? If this is a modeling part of that. Mm -hmm. so the problem that we consider, there is very natural periodical behavior of the of 12 months because then uh, it, the random process was modeled by periodical autoregressive process with this periodical, it's a, it was actually first order progressive process that gave, gave good approximation, but the parameters changed periodically because of a seasonal behavior of the rain, rain falls. And then how you know what will happen next year. So this in 120 stages that was repeated, stochastics, that was repeated for next 10 years, nine years. And which resulted in the problem of 120 stages. The original planning was actually for five years. Another five years was added to deal with a end of horizon effect which resulted in a huge problem of 120 stages. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this take automatically take care of this end of horizon effect and reduce it to 12 stages. It's still big, but much smaller. And the uh, first experiment showed that the results are, seems to be re very reasonable. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Mike. It says, you mentioned in the beginning of the talk about the choice of the expected value that is not an immediate choice. Can you elaborate on that? Oh, this is very, can be this very long talk. Uh, no, uh, traditionally, this, uh, people talk about expected value. This is going a long way back. And you know, in, in MDP, in optimum control, it's like that. Now this, uh, Maybe last 10 years, the alternative of that was robust optimization and look at the worst possible case. There's also a lot of misconceptions about that. And now it's very popular to talk about distributionally robust and risk averse, which in some sense are dual to each other. So this is, uh, instead of taking expected value, one thing uh, we can do, we can take, uh, we can consider some type of trying to control the risk of that. And there's a lot, a lot of discussion about that. I don't have that much time to talk about that. When we look about this, what is so-called nested risk measures, which is a, to some, to some extent also controversial, is that by duality, you can look at that as this also distributionally robust and other way around, so on and on and on. What is interesting is that if one look at this risk measures in nested form, this uh, periodical behavior can be uh, also used with risk measures and this uh, paper with this uh, recent paper, we did the experiment it works as well. It is only the upper bound is we don't know how to compute the upper bound and it seems to be intractable. Okay, so our next question is from uh, Shawash. Um, he said, um, I'm sorry, uh, so from what I understood is that you are solving SDDP with stationarity assumption. This means that you are updating the end value function, unlike traditional SDDP algorithms, where the end value function remains constant. Let me say this, not that not really. Okay. Let's look, you see this promise, yes? This is, this is, it will be infinite, uh, infinite horizon with discount factor. They uh, know why this, why this discount factor? Uh, some people say it's, it has economical interpretation, but this is mainly for, 
to make it a, a possible to formulate it like that. So you see this is in for horizon, and if we assume it is bound, it, it's, it goes, uh, the tail go to zero exponentially fast, the geometric series. Okay. Now, if we start to write the dynamical equation, for the, if we start to write dynamical equation for that, the dynamical equation, uh, this cost of growth function summarize everything that will happen in the future. So here, if, we, if it is completely stationary, everything repeats itself. Right, say period one, right, this value function is the same at every period of time. And I can write that in the form of equation, of Bellman equation. So it doesn't assume constant or anything. In fact, we try to solve this problem. And because it repeats itself, either this uh, in periodical behavior, we can summarize that in writing this equation, what is called Bellman equation. This is how it works. But in the, you can think about that by so we really solve this problem. And you can uh, think about that as this uh, period T is very large, right? It's just approximation. That's a, a, I don't know if, a, if this uh, answer is, uh, is okay, this answer. So we solve this problem and we say, because of the periodical behavior of that, because stationary, we formulate it is in the form of equations which summarize it all that. This is how. So it repeats itself. After period of M, it starts to repeat itself. And then because the first stage solution is deterministic, we have here in actually has M plus one stages. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Emmanuel. Um, it says, um, I have read that for two stages, stochastic mixed integer linear program SAA is very accurate. Is it possible approximate, uh, I guess it's, is it possible to approximate the optimal solution for a small mixed integer linear stochastic problem using SAA and dual approximation? In other words, two random variables in four stages. This is a very difficult question. As I said, even linear multi-stage problem is very difficult to solve this multi-stage problem. Very often in applications, the integers, let's say, it become mixed integer program. Right? So if you look at linear, say linear, it's one of the obvious way is make a relaxation. How it works, you know, this very simple idea that people use is that uh, one relax this integer variables and construct low bound. And in the forward step of SDP method, one simply, because dimension state, state state dimension is usually small, solve this by standard uh, this software. And that could generate upper and lower bounds. Uh, for large problem that from our experience, this, this you probably saw this recent idea of Shabir, Shabir Ahmed, unfortunately you know what happened, and his co-workers. Uh, this idea, uh, for large problem, it's, the gap become very large. Now, in this, uh, in this the experiments that we did here, because we reduced the problem for 120 stages to 12 on these examples, it was really possible to reasonably compute that. And in our paper, the examples of the this last paper that uh, this I mentioned, this is what uh, the state now state of that. Uh, from theoretical point of view, you can, uh, it's all, it doesn't depend on it. It's computation and how to deal with it. So these equations that are written here, really this, no, this is linear. It's not, this is not really that important. You can put anything here, but if it is not linear here, the problem with this is not convex and convex it is everything. So one, of course, one can try to approximate that. And this is probably no big, open big area for research. There are many questions about that. How to, uh, if you know what is the P, how to construct the trial points, convergence, all that is all. Okay, so next question is from Ricardo. Did you say that the approach is showing that the Bellman equation is a contraction? Do you think that uh, an infinite horizon problem, the same approach is okay too? If not, do you have any other approach? Uh, if I look at that, and uh, if we assume that there's a bound, which is a very natural assumption, right? It's a theorem. 
that it is contraction mapping. They said this is a theory which can be proved. Right. And uh, it's all, it's basically only assume this, uh, this, uh, this is boundness of that. And even that is probably can be relaxed. And this is a classical result in uh, MDP. Right? The moment you have this inequality, it is say that it's a contraction mapping. The moment it has a contraction mapping, it has a unique fixed point by bound theory. This is a relatively simple thing. It's possible to prove. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't write the proof here, but it's possible to prove it somehow. Okay. Um, next is from Louis Nataima. Uh, would you please comment on time consistency for periodic infinite horizon multi-stage programs? It's the same. Uh, remember, this is what we try to solve here. Okay. So you can think about that as you one can think about that as a usual multi-stage problem if it's on the infinite horizon, if it is bounded to the ear, it, 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 is, it makes sense. It can go to it as go on. So all this question about time consistency can be applied also here. When we talk about the expected value, it's first of all, what is time consistency? The different approach formulation of that and uh, people uh, and there's no general agreement of that. One of natural meaning of time consistency is that after we, in the beginning of time, before we observe the data, we constructed the po optimal policy. We don't have to recalculate it later. This is very vague because what does it mean we don't have to recalculate? We need to look at the conditional uh, at every time period, we need to look at the conditional optimality criteria. In that, one take a conditional expectation. So everything that holds for usual one holds here. Now, when we, instead of attack, we take the risk, we become much more involved. And there's a lot of discussion of that again, what it means, time cons exactly what time consistently means. And I can give a separate talk on that. Uh, maybe I just mentioned for general risk, it's not even clear, exactly clear what is that. One has to look at the nested form. And if the corresponding risk is not strictly monotone, there exist uh, optimal policies which are not time consistent, so on and on. I don't think I'll have time here to go over there. So if, again, I emphasize there that what we solve, we solve this problem. And you can look at this problem as a usual multi-stage problem with all that applied to it. So next, uh, Johari asks, uh, as the system configuration usually changes a long time, I think that the main contribution is how to deal with end of horizon effects in a non ad hoc procedure. Do you agree? And uh, also congrats and thanks for the nice talk. Uh, no, uh, one of the things that was, uh, I think that was useful here, that end of horizon effect are taken automatically into account. I can give you this, uh, this experiment that we have here. They can see, see many more, in, right? Depend on discount factor. It's uh, at the beginning, it's usually very similar. If we solve 12 or 20, 120, at the end, uh, this, if we do 120 stages, it's a say, it's, for example, here going down. In the beginning, usually in first few stages, it give very similar solutions. So it's in a sense, it automatically take the end of horizon effect. This is what we observe. Um, um, just a, a comment that Emmanuel, uh, by the way, says that uh, you answered the, the question. He, he uh, asked about the uh, mixed integer linear programming um, variant. Uh, next question is from uh, Dirk. Uh, if there was no discount factor, since all problem parameters and uncertainties are periodic, will the optimal policies also be periodic? Uh, let me say that. If there is no discount factor, this is not defined. Why? Because if we, if I remove that, 
right? You have infinite series here, it doesn't converge anywhere. And indeed, uh, so even in the world discount factor, it's this infinite dimensional, even not defined. This is necessary to have it. And one, one of the reasons why I believe why this was introduced long ago, I don't know really who first introduced that. Now, as this discount factor start to get close to one, right, the value of, the, of this solution grows more or less proportionally to one divided by one minus gamma. So when this gamma is this discount factor very close to one, it starts to be larger and larger and larger. And if you don't, if you take it one, it will not converge anyway. It's problem become meaningless. So it's necessary to have it just to for, formulate it in a meaningful way. Um, next question is from Vitor Louis Pinto de Pina Ferreira. Um, do you have an algorithm for selecting restart points for the trust bound algorithm or are they chosen heuristically? I'm not sure what is a, what by, you mean by trust bound, but what was, a, I think, again, this is a just the first results and we're still going on investigation of that. When we look at the dual problem, one of the interesting things that happen about dual problem, that even if the primal problem is a relatively complete recourse, which is necessary for everything here, the dual problem very often doesn't have relatively complete recourse, so one needs to introduce certain type of penalty function. So how this, uh, uh, this type of algorithm works, this say that it works, in the beginning one take very large number, to make sure that this number is larger than the value of the optimal value of the problem taken constant. And then one added cutting plane. As one progress with that, they generate many, many cutting planes which become redundant. So it was found in this empirically in this, this, this paper that it's worthwhile from time to time to start from the beginning. In other words, we already know that the value is smaller certain number. We reduce this initial and remove all the cuts which were generated so far, and again and again, and <coughs> produce much faster convergence. I don't know if this is what you try to ask. There is no trust region here. We cannot do that like in a deterministic case. From the reason what I said, because the solution themselves are random. You don't know where it hit next time, depend on realization of the data. So Shawash is asking, is the software used for the Brazilian system available to test it on the BC Hydra system in Canada? Uh, we have this, uh, this, uh, the, this Python uh, software, which is available online, free. Uh, I believe this one can use it which use all this, uh, this uh, type of uh, this achievements that we have been if they compare with this uh, discretization with the true solution and so on and so on. So if somebody wants, I, you can easily find it on uh, my web page if you go, or if somebody wants all the reference for that, please send me a message, I'll send you references. So there's a, there's a, a software package which can do that. No, of course, at this, as I said, uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, it's very important. How to make standardization of all of that, library and standardization, and this is very involved questions. This is one of the, this very sort of approach, how one can consider very general problems and uh, all the steps, discretization, estimation of error, solution, and so on. So again, if somebody wants more references, I will be happy to send you send them. Okay, um, are there any other questions? I don't see any more. Um, okay, Alexandra Street, could you please comment if you see another method such as linear decision rules or other as promising alternative for tackling the problem? Thank you so much for your nice talk. Yes. Uh, uh, this is one of the, as I said from the beginning, the, 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 top, the topic is very involved and complex. 
So the first point realization that generically it's unsolvable. Now next, what to do about that? This is one of the way that I showed. The recent uh, this, uh, is, uh, this people considered certain time decision rules. This is uh, the idea is very old idea. What one can do, one can uh, consider this uh, parametric family of the decision rules, parameterized by a finite number of parameters, and then put it there, in that, and uh, that reduce multi-stage problem to static problem which in some cases can be solved. In optimal control, if you look at the book of Bertzikas, it's sometimes called a uh, Galerkin method. The way how, of course, this uh, success of that depends on how one chooses the parameterization family of the, this, of the, of the, of the scenarios. So one of the of this is uh, using what is called the linear decision rule. One look at this, this uh, decision as a linear function of our data. And sometimes it, will, it works. I, we per, I personally don't have experience with that numerically. From what I understand, sometimes it works. From my understanding, it works surprisingly well in some application to robust optimization. This is how it all start, was started recently, because this idea also old idea, but uh, many years ago, it was dismissed as uh, not a good idea. Now, uh, the linear decision rules are not the only possibilities. One can look something else. Right? In fact, uh, this uh, my understanding that in, uh, this big successes in uh, this control they have the all types of this approximation of them. So, this is a big area for research to do it in the right way. This recently appeared papers that they tried to do it in two stages. It's some, some combination of the chosen, chosen some parametric family and uh, some type of the first stage decisions. So this is a big question. Yes. And the, how it will work, you know, this is the large part of the depend on modeling, how one model it. What does it mean? to solve multi, this multi-stage problem and so on and so on. It's all of them, in my opinion. Okay, um, I think uh, this, is, uh, this is it. Uh, Vitor, uh, thanks for the answer. And then he says he wondered it after reading your uh, paper on dual bounds. Um, at this point, I, I would uh, like to thank Professor Shapiro again for this uh, very insightful talk. And uh, I would also like to thank everybody once again for the participation and your questions. Uh, I would like to end by uh, making two announcements. Um, the first one is, um, uh, I also sent a message right now to the, uh, to the chat. Uh, so in addition to our social media, the new social media accounts on Twitter and LinkedIn, we now have a YouTube account where we post the um, recorded seminars with the permission of our speaker. And this uh, talk will also be uh, put there and you can see the previous talk in there as well. So if you look at the chat box, I put the link in there. And um, my second announcement is our next speaker, uh, two weeks from now, July 10th, same time. Uh, we're now, uh, we went to Europe, we were in the United States, now we're going to South America, to Chile. And uh, we will be um, uh, having Alejandro um, Joffre, um, um, give us a talk. So I also wanted to announce that. And thanks once again, uh, Professor Shapiro and everybody. Uh, all right. Thank you. So if uh, you are available, uh, and if Professor Shapiro is available, we can take uh, the questions and you know the conversation. Or if you just want to say hi to your colleagues, we can continue. But I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks again. So you want to continue? Um, 